just steps outside the walls that once protected Rome from intruders lies a beautiful basilica. It is dedicated to one of the most important men of the early church, the Apostle of the Gentiles, Saint Paul. It is outside the walls, since Saint Paul suffered martyrdom outside of Rome and because his remains were buried precisely here. The church was built by the Roman Emperor Constantine over the burial place of the Apostle, where it was said that after the Apostle's execution, his followers erected a memorial called the Cella Memoriae. First and foremost, this is a site that started out as a, as a tomb. It started out as a place of sadness and mourning. When St. Paul was killed, somewhere between 65 and 67, his body was brought back to a piece of property belonging to a, to a woman who had been one of his followers. His name, her name was Lucina. And she owned a piece of property right here, a stone's throw from the Tiber and on the Via Ostiense, two main passages for the city. And the body was placed into what we're assuming was a fairly simple, very simple hole in the ground with a few years later, perhaps some sort of memorial placed on top of it so that the first few pilgrims would be able to find the tomb of St. Paul. And then from there, with the moment of the legalization of Christianity, it blossomed into something greater and greater and greater, starting with Constantine, who in 324 built a first church on the exact site of the tomb. However, Constantine's church faced in the opposite direction. It was considerably smaller. And so today you see the front of the atrium as we stand here facing towards the Tiber River. But originally it would have been the apse of the church right where the tomb of Paul was and the facade of the church faced onto the Via Ostiense. And that church simply wasn't big enough to accommodate the needs of the pilgrims and the desire of all these people to come and see the doctor of the Gentiles. The church is built in a unique style and has a particular floor plan, that of an ancient basilica. The uh, word basilica actually comes from the Greeks. It, it, it was an allusion to a royal basileus, which was a royal walkway. The Greeks invented it way back when as a kind of structure to uh, create security and crowd control to meet a king. And what that building had was an axiality sort of a sense of a flow, a well-lit interior, and you could bring people up a central aisle and then bring them out the sides. Now the Romans, after they conquered Greece, saw that building, saw great potential in it, but of course in the Republic they didn't need a building to meet a king, so they brought it to Rome and they basically turned it into a shopping mall. And so they would build little sort of shops and stores off to the side, but always taking advantage of the central light well. But they removed the axiality of the building, so the building didn't have a direction anymore. It was just sort of any which way. However, the building was religiously neutral. So when the Christians were finally in a position with Constantine as of 313 to start building churches, and they are looking around at options for sacred spaces, obviously temples won't do. A, they're small, they're dark, and they've got pagan god cooties. But B, they also don't accommodate people on the inside, and they're dark. So they look at the basilica. The basilica is the perfect building. It's built for size. You can fit as many people as you want in there, giving that idea of the inclusivity. You can flood the building with light, and most importantly, it's a building with an axiality. So the pilgrim comes in, and he's directed to where he's supposed to go. It's a microcosm of our, of our pilgrim journey in life and through faith. Some are doubtful about the tomb of St. Paul, yet the evidence suggests that he was truly buried here. But what they did find was bone matter and some strands of purple and gold sequins. As it just so happens, purple cloth, gold sequins, correspond to some of the finds by Peter's bones. And it indicates a precious, something that was very, very precious, wrapped up in a cloth that usually was only accessible by the emperor. So the, so the discovery of this, this very precious cloth, among or bits of this very precious cloth, among the remnants of human remains, is indicative that indeed, that what, what little there is in the sarcophagus is indeed St. Paul. Stay with us. After the break, learn more about the Basilica of St. Paul.
Welcome back. This is Vaticano. The art in the basilica itself is a sign of ecumenism. When the Pope rebuilt the church after a fire, the whole world contributed to its reconstruction. Leo XII, Gregory XVI, they put out, they, they asked the entire world to contribute, and the entire world did. So not only was this church built in record time, thanks to endless contributions from Christians, Catholics, Protestants, all together, but then it was embellished with extraordinary gifts from the most unexpected quarters. So Tsar Nicholas of Russia sent giant pieces of malachite to turn into the spectacular green altars you see flanking the two sides of the church. And of all things, King Fuad I of Egypt sent alabaster, beautiful translucent Egyptian alabaster to coat the windows and to make these stunning cream-colored columns that, that, that greet you as you enter into the church. So it, this, this wonderful uh, uh, honor to St. Saint, Saint Paul, but also a recognition of the work he did in his lifetime to draw the world together, because it drew together one more time to build this church so quickly that they were able to consecrate it on uh, December 10th of 1854, so 30 years after the fire. The mutual connection of Peter and Paul is also visible in the fact that both basilicas, St. Peter's and St. Paul's, have identical statues of the saints. Only their size differs. One of the most important points about these two basilicas is this twinship between Peter and Paul. In Rome, as you know, we celebrate June 29th as one of our biggest holidays of the year, and we celebrate it as the day that Peter and Paul were both killed. And as a matter of fact, you see the images within the church of the beheading of St. Paul, the crucifixion of St. Peter, celebrated. They're always placed side by side, celebrated on the same day, because as the two apostles died here, they were born together in heaven. And that makes them twins. And for a city that loves twins, we were founded by Romulus and Remus, these new twin martyrs would be the ones that would refound the Christian city, and that is emphasized not only in the matching statues, but when the emperors rebuilt this church in the fifth century, they turned it. So no longer does it face like St. Peter's, like all the other churches, it doesn't face east, it faces west. It faces St. Peter's. So the two of them look at each other, the two brothers embrace across the city in the very urban planning of the two churches. One of the most prominent collections of mosaics in the world is contained within the walls. There is a large gallery of the popes, from St. Peter, the first pope, to the current one, Pope Francis. Every single one is represented. The decoration of this church was very carefully thought out as soon as it was built in 450. It was Pope St. Leo the Great, believe it or not, with all the other things he did. He's also a pope who took a little time to think about church decoration. And he began the idea of representing images of the popes so as to create a genealogy of the papacy, so as to recognize that unbroken line from St. Peter already in his time in 450. And in this church, that tradition has continued. And it was then on top of that, made central in the rebuild of this church. So the same church that seemed to be gone and forgotten in 1883 comes back stronger than ever to emphasize the importance of the papacy with these medallions of the popes, which is the delight of pilgrims. I was talking to the mosaic maker. He showed me the tiles he was using for the face of Francis. And the tiles are the oldest tiles of the Basilica of St. Peter's, the ones that come from the 16th century that originally decorated the church when it was completed. And he took the oldest tiles of St. Peter's and he used them to make the face of the newest pope. So again, the, the wonderful sense of old and new that we do so well with here in Rome. There is, of course, a, a theory that um, when you run out of space for the medallions, the world will be ending. I wouldn't count on it, but there is, you'll hear that quite often, the question of, well, what happens when they run out of space? I, I doubt that it will signal the end of the world. The church is far from being just a tourist attraction, like a museum. It's a living church. 
One of the most important events is the ecumenical prayer vigil, closing the week of unity for Christians. A very, very important appointment in this year, and with this church every year, is the time of, of June 29th when we have the Vespers for the Feast of St. Peter and St. Paul, which take place here. As a matter of fact, this church has been charged for, um, for all sorts of ecumenical activities and initiatives. That's the job of this church, really. And so from uh, the Week of Christian Unity, where it's featured very heavily, but perhaps the most beautiful moment of the year is when the Pope comes, usually with a representative of the Eastern Church. They pray together at the tomb of St. Paul. Next time you are in Rome, make sure you do not miss this monumental beauty so rich in significance, history and art.